Hi there, my name is Brett Fiddler, and I'm presenting To Sonify or Not to Sonify, Educator Perceptions of Auditory Display in Interactive Simulations, on behalf of myself, Bruce Walker, and Emily Moore. So as a bit of motivation, uh, educational interactive sims and games are seeing more uses in more and more unique contexts, but they are also being heard more too as auditory display design becomes more commonplace. When it comes to educational tools in particular, it is often the educator or teacher that makes choices about their use in their curriculums and how students access them. So to us, it's important to grasp educators' perceptions of these tools, which will help, uh, help us inform their, their design, um, inform uh, the distribution to those who would benefit, and deployment by educators in their various circles. So as a part of a large design and research project to implement auditory displays uh, uh, with interactive science simulations to support learning and accessibility, there are about 10 physics simulations with sonifications and sound effects within the FET interactive simulations project. The auditory displays were designed by an interdisciplinary team with expertise in music and composition, physics, linguistics, education research, simulation, and inclusive design, software development, web accessibility, all over. So what we would like then uh, is an opportunity to better understand how to bridge the gap between the things that we design, uh, between the designer and the user when it comes to expectations of these auditory features. So we had some questions we wanted insight on. One, uh, do educators prefer simulations that we create with or without auditory display? Uh, are some auditory displays preferred over others across different simulations? For what teaching contexts uh, are auditory displays considered feasible for use? Uh, and did educators' preferences for the auditory display correlate with something? And in this case, uh, we're thinking about musical sophistication. So then who did we ask to help answer these questions? Well, we designed a survey uh, and asked uh, educators who use the FET Interactive Simulations Project website. Um, so these are visitors to the FET website who can create a user account and opt in to receiving email announcements. Uh, and during this account creation, they can tag themselves as uh, some role. Uh, we emailed an invitation to complete a research survey to the subset of users who selected one or more of uh, the following, you know, teacher, teacher educator, college faculty, service teacher, uh, so on. Of those invited, uh, which was about 202,000, uh, 400,658 did respond to the survey, and uh, of those, 2,471 uh, fully completed it. So uh, within the survey, we chose a subset of four publicly available uh, sonified simulations uh, that represent some of the simpler simulations, uh, which uh, were a little bit more amenable to a moderately length survey. So in the next slide, I'll show off the auditory display of each of these. We created a sound versus no sound survey in which any individual participant would see a total of two simulations, uh, each with and without sound for a total of four simulations. For example, a participant might interact with Ohm's Law without sound and then answer some questions, move on to Ohm's Law with sound and answer some questions, uh, then see John Travoltage, answer a few questions, uh, and then John Travoltage without sound and answer a few questions. Then they'd move on uh, to some ranking questions for uh, preference across all sims, uh, and demographics as well as onto the general musical sophistication factor, which we use to answer question four. For all, regardless of variant, with or without sound, uh, there's a set of shared statements that we could use to compare across the sims and across the conditions, uh, and as well as uh, statements just for the sound, uh, for those simulations that did have sound. First off, do educators prefer the simulations with or without auditory display? Uh, to answer this, we compared the ratings of the shared statements, the rankings, as well as their uh, stated desire for sound features in more simulations. So educators consistently rated the shared statements higher or the same for simulations with auditory display. 
this was true for all save for uh, resistance and wire for statement four related to uh, their recommendation, as well as statement six related to frustration of use. Uh, here's an example of distribution for statement one uh, and uh, also a table just to quickly illustrate that between the sound and no sound variants, we did see a decrease in the lower ratings out of the bottom two and middle uh, and into the top two. So participants were also asked to rank the sims they experienced as a direct measure of sim versus sim preference, uh, as well as an optional explanation, uh, open response. The optional uh, open response actually became quite important as we received over 2,000 text responses, which we have analyzed uh, in other work, but we'll give a peek here. Uh, educators consistently ranked the sims with auditory display over their silent counterparts. Uh, so in this case, a lower number indicates a better rating, uh, and in every single case, we do see a move towards a lower number between no sound and sound. When asked to rate the statement, I believe as many FET simulations as possible should have sound features, over 77.5% of educators rated the statement favorably, selecting a 4 or a 5. Okay, so it seems that auditory display was in general preferred, uh, but were some auditory displays preferred over others? Uh, sound perceptions overall using the sound specific statements uh, were overall very positive, uh, but we did see that they vary between sets of simulations. So we began to see some groupings of sims in the ratings with Ohm's law of resistance and a wire receiving lower ratings than John Travolta and friction. So among uh, many similarities and differences in visual and auditory design for the simulations, for John voltage and friction, there are more real-life scenarios and associated auditory icons, such as the brushing sound or the foot against the carpet and between the books, as opposed to the more abstract sonifications that we have in Ohm's law and resistance and a wire. So a small peek into the open text responses does give us a little bit more insight. So preliminary analysis of the qualitative responses does show a theme consistent with auditory icons and sounds associated in everyday life seem to be considered more favorable and more beneficial for student learning in comparison to more abstract or less real life sounds and sonifications. Uh, third, we have uh, for, for what learning context do educators consider the use of simulations with auditory display to be feasible. And uh, here we really compared uh, between physical and virtual as well as leaving a more open-ended with my students. Uh, and overall, we see that educators believe the sounds would be more suitable in a virtual learning environment over a physical environment. From our qualitative analysis so far, we have found that some educators had concerns about managing the auditory display within classroom settings with many students, with some educators writing about potential issues related to too many sounds in the classroom, or a lack of headphones for all of their students. Uh, these concerns likely contribute to that lower ratings for the statement referring to feasibility in my physical classroom. So lastly, we wanted to know, did educator preferences for the auditory displays correlate with musical sophistication? Uh, we use the gold MSI uh, general factor subscale to measure musical sophistication as a predictor of sim preferences uh, and perceptions, uh, specifically the sound specific statements. So this was chosen as it was validated for situations in which non-musicians, like possibly our educators, are being scored for their perceptions of musical engagement, uh, as well as other factors that contribute to musical sophistication. Fortunately, we were unable to correlate uh, the MSI scores with any trend in survey responses. Uh, we did try trends uh, in MSI score overall with ratings for the sound specific statements. Uh, we looked into trends in the MSI score and ratings at the TAL distribution uh, of the MSI scores, as well as trends uh, in scores for the sub themes of the statements within the, uh, the MSI. Um, so we are unable to find any meaningful correlations between the responses related to the simulations, auditory displays, and MSI scores for this particular educator population. So our takeaways, um, the majority of teachers preferred the simulations with auditory display compared to the same simulations without, uh, and teachers consistently rated the sound variants of the simulations slightly more help helpful, easy to understand, and enjoyable than the without sound versions of the simulations. Uh, educators also found the simulations would sound to be slightly more feasible in a virtual rather than physical context. Uh, musical sophistication, as we measured, did not appear to be a significant predictor of auditory specific ratings for our educators. Uh, and current future work does include the continued analysis of the open text responses and uh, further investigating the difference in user preference of abstract and real life sound design, as indicated within our survey. Uh, and finally, we are continuing to investigate user characteristics, potentially predictive of auditory preference in uh, these simulations, um, such as users' familiarity with the simulation's disciplinary content as well. And with that, 
uh, and thanks and thanks to you uh, regarding education how do you balance using sound for information and having it be chemically by the students I think it's a more of an education question but is it something that you've considered on this project yeah uh, I mean it's it's tricky uh, because you we, we do have this uh, just fed as a whole and, and these education things um, one thing that I've I've really discovered uh, especially putting these uh, sims into informal uh, education contexts is that uh, if you want to keep focus you do want them to still be fun uh, but at the end of the day, we are uh, trying to do sonification, right? We're trying to map sounds to particular concepts, um, though you'll hear the other um, you know, auditory icons and, and other, other portions as well for various uh, user interface. Um, and it is, it is a, uh, a tricky balance. We do, uh, so you mentioned uh, Melina in uh, the chat, uh, about co-design. So for every simulation we do, um, and the reason only 10 of the, uh, I guess, I think it's maybe 11 or 12 now, uh, of the simulations have uh, this uh, sonification and, and sound features and auditory display is because we uh, take a fair bit of time to do college interviews, educator interviews. Um, several of them have been uh, co-designed. Uh, one of them not in, uh, not in, in here, but when we have coming out soon has been co-designed alongside uh, students with uh, dyslexia. Um, and we have several who have been co-designed alongside uh, a few uh, individuals with low or no vision. Um, so we, we take a fair amount of uh, effort to, to test these as we go along uh, and, and make some, uh, multiple interrupt, uh, iterations and, and, and do proto new prototypes. So, uh, you know, some of it's just us knowing that like, if it's if it's too gimmicky or something, it will get annoying, <laughs> uh, and us making our own calls, and and most of it's informed by uh, sort of a co-design like process. Um, there is another question uh, about the goal of the sound designs. Uh, is it to add a new layer of information or reinforce that information that's already present? This is a brilliant question, and uh, I highly recommend uh, talking to me later about this because uh, of those 2000 responses uh, that folks offered, you know, sort of sound related information uh, within the open text response, there was uh, a lot of people who had this perception, and I, I have a paper out that hopefully gets accepted in the next month or two uh, about some of these responses, that they do have this perception that, yeah, uh, these you know, sounds in general should be uh, something that reinforces the visual. Um, but uh, ultimately, that's not our goal. So our goal uh, among the suite of things that we uh, create, so we have not only uh, non-speech auditory display, we're working on uh, speech uh, display, as well as uh, interactive description. So uh, speech screen reader text, um, and these are actually two different things. The, the speech one is actually integrated into the SIM. And uh, so to us, largely speaking, we are trying to uh, add, add extra layers of information, either to um, offer uh, basically any individual to tailor their experience. So if, if you're not interested in paying attention to the visual, hopefully the sonification um, or auditory display can, can serve, serve as that. Um, though we are constantly uh, you know, trying to be aware of, of when they uh, overlap or when they conflict with each other. But yeah, I'd love to talk about that more if, if anybody wants to. Can I ask a quick, um, before we go to the next question, because I'm not familiar with this framework, are these examples that people already use in the classroom or so that the, the teachers are already familiar with them or they're new examples? Not the audio, uh, the, the video, the, the interaction. So the Sims, uh, I actually am not sure if they've used them or not. Um, I did ask uh, if they have, but this is of a list of people who sign up for our website. So there's a very good chance. And I'll just pop the website into the, the chat there again. Um, we do get millions of uses. So there's a good chance that these people, and, and these are some of the older simulations that have been sonified. So there's a pretty uh, good chance that they've seen them, but it's not guaranteed. And I actually don't have a way to determine it. Cool. And something about future work and the, some of the open-ended responses. Uh, did the educators provide any examples of how they anticipate applying the simulations with their students? Um, not too much. So the, the actual phrasing of the uh, question was on uh, basically, if they have any more comments on the auditory display uh, or the sound features, and so for the most part, uh, they they stuck to they stuck to that. Um, there is an exception of like how they talked about 
um, who they would be used for uh, and not so much uh, logistics of how, um, though there are uh, uh, several negative comments and there's some that I've included in this paper as far as the context goes. So like not necessarily how would I use it, but how wouldn't I use it, right? So I wouldn't use it in a giant uh, lecture with everybody doing it all at once because it'd be too noisy and it, I wouldn't be able to talk over them. Or uh, I wouldn't do it if I didn't have everybody have a headphone, uh, you yeah, know, stuff like that. 